Yeah, I, I guess I just have a few piecemeal things to say. Um, the first is I'm, I'm not discounting the role of kinship and other variables uh, in you know the social cohesion and, and social pressures that get people to do uh, uh, terrifically unwise things. Um, and the problem for me is not. Uh, I'm not worried about the bad people in the world. I'm not worried about the, the sociopaths who have frontal lobe anomalies and can't feel empathy for others and therefore, you know, kill and eat people. Um, there are people like Jeffrey Dahmer in the world, and, you know, belief is not necessarily what is so operative. What, what, what scares me the most about certain kinds of divisive dogmatisms, and I think religion being the, the preeminent flavor of that, uh, and at this moment in its history, Islam being the, the uh, most uh, exquisitely uh, pungent of those flavors, uh, is that it, it, it takes, it enables perfectly sane, perfectly rational people, uh, people who are not suffering obvious psychopathology, people who are not suffering uh, the kinds of oppressions that would lead any, you know, uh, anyone else to, to misbehave terribly, uh, to fly planes into buildings um, and to, to seek to get nuclear weapons so that they can blow themselves up in, in certain circumstances. And what I hear Scott doing is discounting the role of specific beliefs. Um, and I think specific, I think it really matters specifically what people believe and that there are innumerable instances where we can see that the proximate cause of certain behavior is precisely what a person believed, in, in this case about God and paradise and, and, the, and the evils of infidels. And uh, so one thing I would say to you, Scott, is that uh, you have some, ex if, if Islam is really orthogonal to this problem, uh, or a, a you know, variable number 10 on your list of variables, um, a few things you should explain. One is, where are the Palestinian Christian suicide bombers? You know, they, there are, most of the Palestinians are Muslims, obviously, but there are Palestinian Christians who have to go through the same checkpoints. They suffer the same humiliations by Israelis. I mean, it seems to me this is practically a science experiment. We have the same people speaking the same language, living in the same deplorable conditions. One group uh, rather reliably forms a death cult, and the other doesn't. Um, and, I th and another example I'd like to put on the table, where are the, the Tibetan Buddhist suicide bombers? If oppression were enough to so derange a culture that they would blow themselves up on school buses and, and where you could get crowds by the tens of thousands calling for the deaths of non-combatants, we would see Tibetan Buddhists blowing themselves up on Chinese school buses. And, and what we don't see, we don't see that. What we do see among Tibetan Buddhists uh, and there are many examples of this. We see Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns who have been tortured in Chinese prisons for decades, but really tortured, you know, with cattle prods and you know, electric shock to the genitals, coming out of, of these decades of torture, saying things like, my greatest fear while I was in prison was that I would lose my sense of compassion for my torturers. Uh, now I submit to you, given that that, that behavior we might, we might think it's pathological on some level to have that kind of compassion, uh, but that behavior is fully explicable in terms of the ideology of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, its emphasis on compassion, its view of, of, of uh, torturing as a, an expression of a person's ignorance within a context of rebirth. I mean, it, it is anchored by a certain kind of worldview. And I would say to you that given what Muslims believe, uh, you will never find a Muslim coming out of decades of torture in an in Israeli prison, a prison uh, who will s speak in those terms at all. Uh, and uh, so that's, you know, you can react to those two examples. And Yeah, good empirical claims. False. Okay. Um, could I just have one slide? One slide. Oh, this is your, the, the handout that's outside, the, the mysterious handout. Um, I don't know if... This is a uh, study by a colleague of mine who works with me on. Could you, you have this? This is a study. This is a study uh, by a colleague of mine 
who works with me on the evolution of religion. Uh, he is a logistic re uh, regression looking at the odds of scapegoating, which is highly correlated with dogmatism and flexibility of belief mm -hmm. and commitment to violence among 10,000 people in over 10,000 people in 10 countries around the world. And so you have Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, other uh, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, non-religious is atheists and agnostics and others. Okay, this is the odds of scapegoating for people who believe there is only one God and it's my God versus people who believe in God as a supernatural entity, okay? Uh, or people who believe that there is no difference. What we've got is uh, in terms of, no, I'm not going to show the rest of them. What we got is exclusivity, that is a tendency to scapegoating, is highest for Catholics, um, Orthodox, and atheists. Okay? It is lowest for Buddhists, Hindus, uh, Muslims. Okay, that's the only empirical evidence I know about sort of intrinsic uh, notions, which a large sample size of uh, scapegoating. And it's, as I said, it's virtually identical for violence and inflexibility of belief. Now, with respect to um, Palestinians, Palest oh, Buddhists, right? Mm. Well, you know, Buddhists, there were Japanese Buddhists who were kamikaze, yeah. of course. And uh, the Sri Lankan army uh, actually is threatening to do suicide squads against the Tamil Tigers, who are Hindu uh, suicide squads. As far as the Palestinians are concerned, uh, you get about 70% support, depending on the threat perception at the moment the survey is done. The surveys are done mostly by Khalil Shikaki of the Palestinian Center, for, Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in Ramallah. You get about 70% in a random um, sample uh, among Christians for uh, support for suicide terrorism, depending on threat perception. Now, the reason there aren't almost none, although Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades does allow Christians, uh, the reason that... Have there been Christian suicide bombers? No. Okay. The, the reason that there isn't is because the particular groups that are formed um, are... Actually, there have been PFLP suicide bombers. Palestinian uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. There have been um, several, six cases, I believe. There's a mostly Christian Marxist organization. The reason they have suicide bombers is very simple. And the reason Al-Qaeda has it is very simple. Um, suicide bombing, especially by Hamas operatives and Al-Qaeda operatives, are by the, their best and brightest. That is, the majority of suicide bombers are college educated, fairly well off relative to the surrounding populations, no desperation, poverty, uh, no criminal backgrounds, no insanity, no suicidal tendencies. And the organizations make a very costly commitment, a sort of Zahavi handicapping principle, to use their best and their brightest to get the community to trust them and, and um, increase their political market share. And they've been so unbelievably successful that the PFLP, which is a secular Marxist organization, the DFLP, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, if you go to their websites, they're indistinguishable now from the Hamas. That is, you get incantations, almost Quranic. They're not Quranic, but they use the same words uh, for, for sacrifice. Um, and Al-Qaeda, the, the success of suicide bombing uh, by Al-Qaeda is a very contingent affair very similar to, to the Nazis, okay? There's a marvelous book called 30 Days. It's about Hitler's rise to power, to power in January 1933. On January 1st, the major newspapers in Germany declared Hitler's party dead. He had lost two successive elections. By the end of the month, he's chancellor of Germany through an unbelievably improbable event, set of events that no one would have predicted. And that takes over the fascist movement. Basically, it becomes the paragon of fascism around the world. Bin Laden, the same thing. He was one of about 40 Mujahideen commanders. And he got this bright idea basically from a combination of the Hezbollah and the Tamil Tigers 
used it effectively, created unbelievable theater. And that theater was inordinately successful at, mo again, it was a media-driven political awakening, at mobilizing consciousness among a vast number of people. And Islam had this characteristic. It is a messianic religion, like Christianity, like all the monotheisms, and like all the isms, communism, anarchism, all the secular versions of Christianity. And it is a multi, it, it is a multi state system. And in the sort of advance of a unipolar United States power, it was seen by many people, this theater, this successful theater, as empowering these non state actors. And so it became widely popular. So even bin Laden's enemies joined him and called themselves Al-Qaeda. But by the way, Al-Qaeda was never in common use until the United States put the word out there in the Southern District Court of New York in 1990 for the bombing of the uh, African embassies, when just like in the Joe Valachi trial, the prosecutor asked Jamal al-Fadl, do you know of Al-Qaeda? He says, well, it's a list. And who's on this list? Well, it was a list we made up in Afghanistan to track the Mujahideen. So Al-Qaeda is this organization by bin Laden. And what else does Al-Qaeda do? And by the time the end of the transcript is finished, Al-Qaeda becomes a concept that everybody's talking about. It's publicized around the world. And it's the first concept out there uh, at 9-11. And some, suddenly, everybody's Al-Qaeda. But if you go to Guantanamo and you ask yeah, the people, yeah. are they Al-Qaeda, they say no. So, let me, can I just address some of the things we brought up?